services. I probably have too much content for 45 minutes, so I imagine they're going to stop me towards the end of this, but try to get through as much as I can. So over the past year, one of my uh, major projects has been um, developing and then using the X Exchange module for configuring Exchange 2013. Um, within it, we have 29 different resources for configuring all sorts of different aspects of Exchange. So today I'm going to kind of talk about uh, my experience uh, developing the module, why I decided to, um, what was the business case for it, uh, some issues I hit along the way, um, and you know what went well, uh, what didn't. So a little bit about myself, I've been working in IT since 1999. Um, I joined Microsoft in 2006 and I started out in our support organization. So I was a support escalation engineer first, um, focusing on exchange infrastructure, then uh, became an escalation engineer. So I uh, specialized in debugging co uh, production exchange code issues that our customers ran into. Since 2012, I've been in Microsoft Consulting and uh, still specialize in exchange. Um, the whole time I've been uh, dedicated to the same customer. So it's a very large customer. They have about 200,000 users and mailboxes, a very complex environment. Um, for them, I specialize in exchange architecture, design, and deployment, um, and then to a lesser extent, but uh, what I like to do more is uh, exchange and uh, also link automation. So I do PowerShell whenever I can. Um, I also like to write uh, C Sharp um, .NET applications for um, just uh, little tools for um, automating various stuff within exchange and link. So what we're gonna to cover today, um, why I chose to use DSC for this project, um, the DSC resources that were either developed or used for the project. I'm gonna walk over um, some highlights of the configuration scripts. Not gonna dig into anything too Exchange specific because I'm sure um, not everyone here works with Exchange. Um, some challenges we had with executing the configurations and then positives with the experience. So why did I choose DSC? Um, the problem I had was that needed a way to automate uh, configuration and deployment of 120 uh, Exchange 2013 servers, servicing 200,000 mailboxes. My customer has a very heavily customized environment. Um, pretty much wherever they can customize Exchange, they like to customize Exchange. And a lot of those configuration items are, or not a lot, but a handful of configuration items are prone to getting reverted. Um, when you apply, in Exchange 2010, when you applied service packs, they would revert some configuration settings. With Exchange 2013, we have cumulative updates, which come out quarterly and are applied in the same fashion. So those can blow away settings as well. Um, one of the notable settings is web.config files for Exchange virtual directories. If you do any customizations in those, when you apply these updates, Exchange basically just puts a fresh web.config over the top because they don't really want to assume you know, that they can figure out what you, how you had customized it. So with Exchange 2010, um, we didn't discover that till we got into their operational phase where we, had, um, we would have issues where you know, we'd start getting help desk calls where users couldn't connect. And then after you know, days of troubleshooting or you know, sometimes less, we would figure out that something we had initially configured had reverted back to its default setting. So for them, we started out with just standard PowerShell scripts for configuration. Once we started noticing these settings getting reverted, we came up with matching verification scripts as a stopgap measure. But for those, we would essentially have to um, run them manually. Um, you know, after they would apply a service pack, we would start going in and running the verification script to make sure that all the settings um, were still in compliance, and if not, then we would run their configuration scripts. Um, so it's kind of a manual process. We'd also do that during troubleshooting. And then we also had to maintain configuration, you know, configuration multiple places. If we changed the configuration, we would have to go update both the configuration and verification scripts. So once DSE came out, I knew that that was a, a much better solution for the issue because not only could we set our configuration, but we could put our DSC um, local configuration manager in apply and autocorrect mode, and we'd be able to um, detect and correct configuration drift. So starting out, um, we didn't actually intend to do their entire deployment and configuration with DSC. We just wanted to uh, manage some key settings. Uh, specifically, we wanted to configure Exchange Virtual Directory settings. Um, the Exchange Virtual Directories in IIS are um, the majority of what the clients connect to. So if you have like an authentication setting revert, your Outlook clients start getting credential prompts or clients can't connect for other reasons and you start getting help desk calls. 
So working with, um, I, I was the primary author of the Exchange module, but I actually worked with a couple other Microsoft engineers, uh, Jason Walker in Microsoft Consulting Services, and then Michael Green, who is a, a program manager in the Windows sy Server and System Center team. So starting out, uh, we prioritized um, uh, doing, configuring Exchange Virtual Directories with DSC because those were the most prone to getting reverted and were also the most impactful to end users. So for that, that was about seven or eight resources. And by the time we had finished those seven or eight resources, which I think took us you know, a couple weeks, um, we got the hang of doing DSE. We had learned all the, the hard stuff, you know, um, all the, the prerequisite knowledge for doing DSE. And then for my customer, we kind of made a decision. We had to make a decision whether we wanted to do the rest of our settings and configuration with standard PowerShell scripts and then also maintain a separate DSC solution or if we wanted to do everything in DSC. Ultimately, we chose to do everything in DSC just because it was we could have all our settings in a single place. It was less technologies for their administrators to have to learn and have to have to manage. So some additional problems that we were able to solve. Um, one time, uh, a one time um, run of running JetStress. Uh, JetStress is a tool that you use for uh, hardware validation of Exchange servers before you install Exchange. So usually when you design Exchange, you design it for um, to be able to handle a certain amount of IOPS on your disks, um, to be able to handle a certain processor load. We'll run the JetStress tool beforehand to make sure it meets that design. So we developed a DSC resource for um, basically acting as a wrapper, it would kick off uh, jet stress, and then once it was done, it would inspect the jet stress results, look for whether that, um, that uh, res uh, report contained a success or not, and then that's what um, would signify whether DSE was su successful or not. We were able to install Exchange, um, basically created a wrapper for Exchange setup where we'll run, uh, it'll run setup, and then to see if the resource was successful or not, it'll inspect some known registry keys for Exchange to see um, if, uh, if setup completed or not. Um, some resources for setting up Exchange database availability groups, or DAGs, um, which is Exchange's high availability implementation via clusters and multiple copies of databases. Uh, um, some resources I'm going to demo um, in uh, just a couple slides are uh, managing mount points in BitLocker, so I won't get into that right now. Um, we were able to maintain web.config modifications using some existing modules. And then finally, ensuring Exchange antivirus settings. And that was actually one uh, a resource that we came up with once we got into operations mode. When we initially deployed all the customers Exchange servers, um, Exchange setup has a switch to disable the out-of-the-box antivirus. So my customer uses a third-party antivirus. And after we had deployed all 120 servers, we noticed that six of the servers still had Exchange antivirus installed. So at that point, we decided to just create a custom DSC resource. We didn't know what reverted it, and we didn't want it to revert in the future. So, so the solution overview of what we uh, used for my customer um, created two new uh, modules. So the X Exchange module, which consists of 29 resources total, um, the X BitLocker module, which has three resources, and then we were able to reuse some existing DSC modules as well. Um, we were able to use the X Service resource. Um, we use that for configuring a couple exchange services that um, have a manual startup by default, and we want to set those to automatic. So um, we were able to use the X firewall resource for configuring Windows firewall properties, and also the X web configuration property resource. And that's one of the key resources we used for maintaining web.config settings, or web.config changes. So here's an eye chart right here. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is kind of just an overview of all the X Exchange resources. The biggest table on the left here are resources that correspond directly to Exchange commandlets. So when we were writing these, we wanted to have a direct mapping between the existing Exchange commandlet sets and um, the DSC resource names where possible, and also have a mapping of the, uh, of the parameters that were available on those Exchange commandlets as well. So for instance, the XEXEH client access server resource, that corresponds to the get and set dash client access server commandlets. Similarly for Outlook web access, we have the XEXEH OA virtual directory resource, and that corresponds to get and set dash OA virtual directory. And then we also had some custom non-commandlet based resources. We've already talked about a couple of those, like our uh, resource for installing Exchange. Doesn't actually um, run any Exchange PowerShell commandlets, 
but it installs it and then ensures that it happened. Same thing with in running jet stress and cleaning it up. And then finally, we have some synchronization resources. These are resources for, that we can use in depends on clauses to make sure certain things happen before we move on. Um, like Active Directory for Exchange, you have to prepare your schema before you can install it. So this resource, wait for AD prep right there, um, that's something you can use and depends on. And until one node or you know, an administrator has gone and prepared the schema, none of the other nodes will be able to move on in their script. Similarly, we have resources for waiting for a database availability group to be created before we can add nodes to it and for um, databases to be created before we can add database copies to that. And this is an example uh, a little deeper of how, um, how uh, uh, X-Exchange resource maps directly to um, an Exchange commandlet. So the Exchange commandlet is set over a virtual directory. And in here, I'm basically just you know, specifying an identity, server name, and uh, the website, and then um, three different authentication settings. You can see that all those parameters and the way that you can configure them map directly in here. So we have identity, basic, and forms and Windows authentication. Only difference is that we also have a credential resource. So for the majority of X Exchange resources, we actually have to do a remote PowerShell session to Exchange um, before we can configure it. The reason being for that is that Exchange, um, you can actually do local PowerShell sessions to manage Exchange, but Microsoft doesn't support it whatsoever. Um, we have to do it via remote PowerShell session because that's how Exchange in, uh, performs RBAC and um, states which, uh, which commandlets you have available to run. So for that, we have to specify um, credentials that we can pass in. And then for all these resources, the first thing they do um, for the get, set, and test target resource functions, they'll establish a remote PowerShell session to exchange using those credentials, and then they'll go ahead and uh, you know, test or uh, set the configuration. I'm gonna show, so this is the, I'm just gonna walk through one of the simpler resources. Um, this is the OA virtual directory resource, which I was just showing. And you can see here, we have a number of parameters. So for the majority of these resources, we wanted to take the, the, the exact parameter set that was available um, for the exchange commandlets, and that's documented on TechNet, and port those over to the DSC resource. So whatever you can do in sta your standard PowerShell scripts, you can do in a DSC as well. We also had a couple custom parameters here and there, like the credential resource doesn't exist, or parameter doesn't exist. A lot of these have an allow service restart parameter, which is basically um, allows uh, the resource to recycle an IIS app pool or do an IIS reset or potentially reboot the server. The rest of them correspond directly to exchange commandlets. So for our get dash target resource um, function, um, and in most of these, the first thing they'll do um, while we were developing these, we started hitting a lot of uh, common functions. So we put um, a lot of these common functions into an X exchange common file so that we didn't have to you know, drop the same functions and all of these different files. So first thing we do, we import um, this common file and then we go ahead and um, get the remote exchange session. Um, and that actually reused um, out of the box when you open the exchange management shell, there's a script that ships with exchange that um, goes out and it'll try to create a remote PowerShell session to itself. And if that fails, it'll automatically discover another server to connect to. In addition to that, it also loads some Exchange DLLs. So initially we tried to just do a PowerShell session using new-ps session, but we found that we weren't getting strong Exchange type names. We were just getting generic, um, generic .NET types when we actually inspected it. So it made it hard to work with some of the parameters that we were getting back. Using the, the built-in exchange script, we get um, strongly typed names. We can actually um, use the, the exchange types um, as are in the, the exchange DLLs and um, whatever else we're accessing. So pretty much all the functions, uh, get, set, and test, will create a remote PowerShell session to exchange first. And then you can see here, um, uh, we call get OA virtual directory. So most of them, most of the get target resource, we'll just call it the get commandlet for that. And here, I, uh, Actually, have a wrapper function for get OA virtual directory. And if I jump down to what this function looks like, what it's really doing is just in the middle, we can see it's running get OA virtual directory and um, passing in the parameters that were specified. Now, the reason I put it in a wrapper 
It's for one, so that we can call this function um, from other, um, from set target resource and test target resource. And also because some of the parameters in DSC aren't available on the exchange commandlets. When we're running get OA virtual directory, we can't necessarily pass all these uh, parameters that are available here um, to get OA virtual directory. Essentially, the only thing it'll take is identity or potentially domain controller. So I ended up writing a, a helper function, remove parameters, which will work with the, um, the PS bound parameters hash table that's passed in. And you can either tell it, um, either specify params to keep, and it'll essentially remove all the parameters from that hash table, except for the ones you specify. Or there's also a, um, a sibling switch params to add, or uh, params to remove, where you can remove all parameters except for um, the, the, the ones you spec, or yeah, uh, remove uh, just the parameters you specified. And then for our other res or our other function, set target resource, we can see this kind of does the same stuff, um, loads our helper module, um, does a remote power source session to exchange, and then ultimately um, runs set or virtual directory with our PS bound parameters. We can see here, we also ran the remove parameters function because credential and allow service restart, those were just DSE specific parameters that I created. They have no um, meaning in exchange. And then finally, we have test target resource. And you'll notice, and you probably already noticed, this resource has a lot of parameters. Some of the other resources have a lot more parameters. And um, we ended up writing some um, helper functions for verifying these parameters um, based off of what the exchange data type was. So essentially, we'll pat, um, in our test function, we'll go through and verify each of the settings that were passed in. We'll pass in what our expected value was, um, what the actual value was that we got back from exchange, and then we can pass in a hash table. And then that helper function will um, either report back that it was uh, successful or not, um, and if, uh, if the test fails, it'll log to the screen if you're running in verbose mode so that you know um, which parameter uh, caused the test to fail. And I'm going pretty quickly. Any uh, questions so far? All right. All right, so let me jump back into this. The other um, custom module that was created was the XBitLocker module. I'm actually not sure if, uh, I don't see too many downloads or too many comments of this, so I'm not sure if many people are using this. Um, the last two resources do correspond directly to uh, existing BitLocker commandlets, um, but we don't actually use this with my customer. Um, the only one we use is the BL Auto BitLocker resource. And what that is for is for applying BitLocker to disks that meet a certain criteria. So regardless of the number of disks on your system, if they're above a certain size or if they're a certain disk type and they don't have BitLocker on them, BitLocker will automatically get applied. My customer chose to uh, apply BitLocker to all their Exchange database disks as they outsource their uh, data center operations. And without encrypting those disks, a vendor could potentially go pull a disk you know, um, and uh, take the database off it, put it in their Exchange environment and get access to all the mail. So we want to protect all their database disks. And with that, I'm going to do a demo of um, automating mount point setup and um, BitLocker setup. There's a couple resources that I've already talked about. So before I get started, just want to show, um, this is my Exchange Lab server, um, show that I have four, um, four extra disks that aren't configured on this system right now. Um, my goal right now is to configure three of these. So um, just wanted to show uh, that I didn't actually configure it in advance before I get started. And I'm gonna go ahead and run this real quick and then I'll talk about what it's actually doing. All right, so we have two, two resources in use here, the auto mount point resource and the auto bit locker resource. The driver for this was that Exchange, has, Exchange 2013 has a concept called auto reseed, where you can have a number of database disks holding your databases, but you can also have one or more spare volumes that are just basically hanging out there waiting for uh, a disk failure. What will happen is if one of your database disks fails, Exchange will go through a workflow and detest, detect that that is unrecoverable. And eventually what it'll do, it'll take the mount points that were on that disk, it'll reassign them to one of the spare disks, and then it'll request 
that copies of that database from another server get pulled over. At that point, what the administrator would have to do is they would go pull the failed disk and then they would put in a new good disk and they would reset up this mount point structure and then reapply BitLocker. The mount point structure can actually be fairly complex, however. Um, for my customer, um, and because of the auto reseed implementation, they have to have five mount points per disk and they have 22 database disks. So it's like, you know, um, quite a few mount points. Can't do the math in my head right now. <laughs> Um, so what this is doing is essentially configuring two disks to hold um, databases. So disk one is gonna have um, four databases, disk two is gonna have four databases as well, and then we're also gonna have a spare volume. And then the auto bit locker resource, what we're doing here is we're looking for disks that are of type fixed. If you run get dash volume, um, disks come back with a certain disk type. So we're looking for disks of type fixed that um, are at least 10 gigabytes in size. And this is intentionally low uh, for my customer's environment where I actually have this specified as four terabytes. So if, unless we find a disk that's four terabytes and doesn't have BitLocker on it, we're not gonna touch it. And, but for anything that does meet that criteria, we'll also apply BitLocker to it. So script ran through, I believe successfully. Let me go ahead and ensure that there is no red in there. I should also mention that uh, the auto mount point resource in the background, it's using disk part to do the disk configuration. And there are, I know there are um, exchange commandlets, well, I now know there are exchange commandlets for configuring disks. At the time, I did not. Um, but the additional reason that uh, we use disk part is because that's what the previous exchange teams um, supported uh, mount point configuration scripts were using. So essentially, I just wanted to take the existing scripts that the Exchange product group had already signed off on, tested a bunch, and then port that functionality. So I actually borrowed a lot of their code and just put it in DSC. All right, so the script has run through and we can see that I now have three configured disks and they're all showing BitLocker encrypted on them. If I look at these further, my disk one, um, I have DB one through four, as I had specified in my script. Um, I also have an exfol mount point, and this is a, a required one for all disks, whether they have databases or spares. Similarly, I'll look at my exfol2, and I have five mount points, four for databases and one for the exchange volume. And then under exfol3, this is my spare disk. So right now, I only have uh, one volume on there. So at this point, I'm going to simulate a disk failure, basically just going to rip out uh, one of these disks on my system. Go right here, remove. I do not want to checkpoint it. So at this point, disk just disappeared. And when we're in operations, we need to have three disks configured, but at this point, we only have two. It'll kind of um, say that, you know, administrator just came and dropped a, a new disk in there, even though we know that is already there. I'm gonna have to do one additional step that I wouldn't have to do in production. In production, Exchange would remap these mount points over to one of the disks, uh, over to the spare disk, but the whole process takes about an hour, which I can't do right now. So I'm just gonna manually delete these and let the, um, the auto mount point resource handle that instead. So I'll go ahead and rerun this resource. It'll go through and um, going to scroll by pretty quickly, but what it saw is that there should have been three total mount points configured, but we only found two mount points configured with appropriate volume. So that's kind of, uh, that's what caused our test to fail and what caused us to run set target resource with our uh, auto mount point resource. Um, so that configured our extra disk and then auto BitLocker came along and saw that we had a disk configured meeting its criteria, but it didn't have BitLocker on it. So it put it on there. So now when I go back, I still have exvol2, and it still has the same mount points it had on it before. exvol3, which was previously the spare, now has all its database mount points moved over to it. And then exvol4, which was previously uninitialized, is now our new spare. So pretty much uh, the server is back, back the way it was, and we're prepped for another disk failure in case it occurs. Any questions? All right. Am I going too fast? <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to talk about the actual configuration script implementation. So the initial, um, when we were initially uh, trying to figure out this solution, 
Um, I had envisioned being able to run everything in a single, in one single massive DSE script to configure the whole servers. Um, we had some issues along the way, which basically prevented that from happening, which I'm gonna talk about. So essentially we had to break up our deployment into two phases. We have our initial setup and deployment phase, and then we had an ongoing configuration phase. For the initial setup and deployment, did that all in push mode. Um, one well, of the main reasons for that is because we wanted to be able, it's much easier to inspect the output, um, do it in verbose and see, you know, which servers failed, which resource they failed on, you know, particular errors that came up. And then if we noticed any failures, we could go remediate that server. And then for this phase, we originally did it in apply and monitor, um, but I would now actually recommend doing it in apply only. Um, some of these resource exchange resources can run um, uh, they, they can take a couple minutes to run depending on how, or sorry, I should say your script can take a couple minutes to run depending on how many resources you configure in it. And we would hit situations where we would, you know, run a script, try to apply the next script, but there would be, um, the configuration was automatically testing itself in the background. So we would have to either force it or go kill WMI and then blast a new configuration over it. So now I would recommend just doing it for that initial, initial phase, just do it in apply only. So that unless you're explicitly running a script, you're not gonna hit a point where it's, you know, um, you're trying to push out a new script and it's already checking in the background. So out of these seven, seven different um, sub phases of the setup and deployment phase, the only two we actually had to do separately were the installation and running of jet stress and the removal and cleanup of jet stress. The reason for that, I initially tried to do it in a single script. Um, but the way the jet stress resource works is it looks to see if jet stress was ever run, and if not, then it'll install jet stress, it'll run it. And what would happen was we would install and run jet stress, and then we would verify it would verify that the jet stress run was good, and then it would go on and do the removal and cleanup of jet stress. And then the server would reboot, because that's required. But after that reboot, it would, there would be nothing to signify that jet stress had ever run. So we'd basically get in this loop where we would continuously be running. Yes? I think you don't go to cover that. Yep. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Yeah, I also think apply only may, uh, may cover that too. Because, uh, yeah, but I'm um, not positive. But yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that. So after that, the rest of these, depending on the size of the environment, can definitely be run in a single script. And until we got to my customer's production environment, we actually did run those in a, in a single script. Um, so in my lab environment and in my customer's two lab environments, we could run those in a single script and didn't hit, hit any issues. Once we got to their production environment, which is fairly large, has some, can have some AD replication issues, we started hitting issues where even though we specified a domain <laughs> controller to use on these switch, or uh, on our uh, resources, Exchange was at times trying to access other um, domain controllers and um, we'd get servers out of sync and our, our resources would basically blow up. So for these last three, the configuring of the DAG and configuring the databases and the copies, what we'd essentially do is just run the set of scripts against the server, wait for our known Active Directory replication time, which was 15 minutes, and then also, uh, and then move on to the next script. And that way we would be sure the Active Directory replication had uh, occurred. Other reason we decided to do this because we spent a, a decent number, amount of time troubleshooting it and trying to do customizations, and uh, it eventually it seemed like it was just going to take too much time, so we, we broke it up. Once we're done with the complete setup and deployment of Exchange, then we switch over to ongoing configuration mode. Our, for my customer, our goal is to initially get the poll mode, but um, due to other uh, competing projects and priorities, we haven't got there yet. So we're actually still doing our configurations via push mode, but the key is that we're doing um, setting the local configuration manager to apply and autocorrect. So that is how we can prevent, you know, monitor for and um, uh, prevent configuration drift. And for that, that is a single script, and it's basically just a combination of scripts four through seven up there. And with that, I'm actually going to show you a generalized version of what these scripts look like. So this is essentially the same folder that I use for my customer. Um, see, all the scripts are nicely numbered, so they can go through one script at a time, um, no, and then you know move on to the next step. Uh, but these have been generalized, so they don't have any customer-specific information in there. So the first thing you can see here is we're, um, we run a script configure LCM for deployments. 
um, go in there. This one is pretty straightforward. All it's doing is one, we're specifying the certificate that Exchange is going to use for encrypting and decrypting credentials, setting our configuration mode to apply only. And again, originally we had that at apply and monitor, and now um, for this initial deployment, I would probably recommend doing apply only instead. And then lastly, we set the nodes to reboot if needed, so that during the initial setup, if any of the resources require a reboot, it'll just happen automatically. And the administrator doesn't have to go you know, send off a restart computer command or log into them locally and uh, do a restart. So um, next, I'm gonna jump a couple, uh, a couple scripts forward. And this is our configure server setting script. This is the first script that we run after Exchange has been installed. And this script contains all the settings that are um, basically have no replication constraints. Um, you know, we can do them all. We can do all all 120 servers at once, and no servers have to wait for stuff on other servers to complete. And this is using you can see two resources: X Exchange and X Web Administration. That's for ma managing uh, maintaining the web.config. Now within the node block, you can see I have a cust uh, three custom variables, DAG settings, CAS settings all, and CAS settings per site. The reason for this is that for my customers 120 servers, they have settings that apply to the whole group of servers. Now with those servers, they're broken up into 10 database availability groups consisting of 12 nodes. And those DAGs have some DAG specific settings, like each, each DAG has a specific certificate that has just those server names in it. Similarly, we have client access settings, URLs that apply to all servers, and we have client access settings that depend on where the Active Directory site of where the server is located. So here I'm mapping into our configuration data file. And before I can jump into that, I'll show you one thing. So see, I have two Exchange Settings files here, Exchange Settings-Lab and Exchange Settings-Prod. These are our configuration data files. I use the lab one in my lab, the customer uses prod in their production environment. And in reality, we have four. Um, so I have one for my lab, customer has two for their um, te two test labs, and then one for their production environment. And we can go through in a sequence manner. I can do all my development, be fairly confident that I've tested it on my lab machine, and then we can test it out in their labs and then test it out in production. Oops, what did I just do there? Uh, all, right. Um, all right, and then for all of these scripts, basically at the bottom where we compile it, we just specify which exchange settings file we use, and you know I can just uh, flip this from lab to prod when I want to hand it over to my customer. So back to the custom variables I was talking about. So here we're, to, to get the DAG settings, we're indexing into our configuration data directly. And see we're accessing here node.dagid. Now where this is coming from, if we look in here, in the all nodes block, we have all our individual nodes defined. And I have these two custom properties here, DAG ID and CAS ID. These are where we're signifying which specific, um, which of these groupings these particular servers are defined to. So here for this uh, server 0101, it belongs to DAG01 and Site1 CAS for its CAS ID. Now, the way I implemented this was I essentially created hash tables outside of all nodes. So in addition to all nodes, I have hash tables corresponding to each of the DAGs. So for my customer, they have 12 different DAG blocks. And you can see here we have DAG specific settings, the DAG name, some specific DAG IPs. We have settings that are gonna to apply to all CAS. So um, in this example, all CAS are gonna have a single load balance external URL. And then we're gonna have site specific information depending on um, the exchange server. So site one CAS is gonna have a load balance FQDN of mail-site1.contoso.com. And then all site two CAS are gonna have a load balance FQDN of mail-site2.contoso.com. And again, um, so, when we go through, and for each node we go through, we essentially just map into those additional hash tables and assign those to variables. So then when we're going through the rest of the script, we can just access those um, directly. And for the rest of the configuration script, wherever we could, we hard, or, uh, hard coded um, specific, or hard coded settings directly into the script. So if stuff isn't gonna change between environments, that would just be hard coded directly in the configuration script. 
The only stuff that goes in the configuration data is environment specific stuff. You know, um, URLs that may change, the domain suffix is gonna change, stuff like that. So uh, I'm not gonna walk through this whole thing, um, but um, some examples of how we're using this. Um, under the exchange certificate resource, you know, we've already um, assigned this DAG settings variable. So when we get to exchange certificate, we can just add access DAG settings thumbprint and then that maps directly to this thumbprint property that had been uh, in either DAG1 or DAG2. And then for some of our other resources, like this uh, auto discover service internal URI, regardless of environment, we're always going to have um, a URL prefix of HTTPS and a URL suffix of slash auto discover slash auto discover .xml. What's going to change is the actual load balance FQDN. So here, um, the auto discover URL was site specific. So we can get the user cast settings per site variable and then map to the internal namespace property, which if I switch back over here, corresponds to this site one CAS or site two CAS and internal namespace. So, yes. Uh, I know uh, pretty much all your work has been uh, pretty exchange focused in this, uh, in, and especially what you're showing us. Mm -hmm. But has there been any investigation as far, it, as far as taking it further in the environment and getting other servers and services under control uh, through desired state configuration, and have you looked at how that might play in with your configuration data structure? For my customer, the exchange team is the guinea pigs. <laughs> They're the first ones in the organization using DSC. So haven't really had any. I, I've uh, presented to some of their other teams, but I'm not quite aware of um, you know uh, what they're doing. Okay. But eventually, you know, I, I would not be surprised if they decide to do that. You know, maybe we do partial configurations and the Windows server team can put out a partial configuration for, you know, you know, just generic Windows settings. And then we can have a partial configuration for exchange specific settings, stuff like that. So. All right. Um, then real quickly, a um, couple things I want to call out. Once we've gone through the initial setup and deployment, we configure the LCM again. Um, this time we set reboot node if needed back to false because once we get into production we don't want our uh, nodes rebooting uh, just whenever they want. We want that to be an administrator driven operation. And then the key thing is that we set our configuration mode to apply and autocorrect. And then lastly we run um, our ongoing configuration script which as I mentioned was basically just a combination of uh, the scripts that ran before it. So once we're in ongoing configuration, we don't have to worry about Active Directory replication anymore. Stuff's uh, configured for the most part, and we're not going to have to worry about those uh, cross-site dependencies. All right. So next, I'm going to talk about some issues encountered during operation. And this is uh, not stuff during development. This is actually um, running these scripts. So the first issue, uh, one of the biggest issues we hit was that uh, um, we we're getting system out of memory exception errors. The reason for this is, as I mentioned, um, the majority of these, these resources create a remote power cell session to exchange. And um, if you're running multiple resources within the same script, we'll actually reuse that remote power cell session. So we don't have to um, reestablish a new session for each resource. So what was happening was um, we were essentially, the remote power cell session was consuming memory faster than it was releasing memory. And eventually we would hit the out of the box um, WMI limits of 512 megs per WMI host or a gig for all WMI hosts on the system. After a little bit of troubleshooting, I found this blog on TechNet, which talked about how to increase the WMI quotas via a GUI tool. I ended up writing a script for doing it, um, doing it via PowerShell. Uh, but we were able to uh, essentially double the quota. So we raised the, the per host quota to a gig and the, the quota for all hosts to two gigs. Since then, we haven't hit any out of memory errors. Have you considered adding that as a resource into your yeah. configuration? No, nah, that would be a good resource though. Yeah. So the next uh, issue, and I'm sure anyone in here that's done DSC has seen this error before. Um, essentially, you would try to execute a configuration, and it would say send configuration apply method is already in progress, uh, must return before blah, 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 blah. Um, so this would essentially occur if exchange was, or if the DSC script was running in the background because it was in apply and monitor, it was testing itself, and it just wouldn't accept a new configuration at the time. 
Sometimes using the force switch with start DSC configuration would work, but not always. So the most recent, and I think the best solution for this is to um, take the machines out of continuous checking mode before um, we do configuration changes. So for this, I'm talking about specifically, we've done, I don't know, probably like five or six um, configuration changes since going into production. And um, so for this, we take it from apply and autocorrect and put it in apply only, maybe uh, an hour before our outage window, and then um, apply our new configuration. And then once we're done, put it back into continuous checking mode. If we do that far enough in advance, we'll know that um, the, the machine shouldn't be checking their configuration when we go to apply a new configuration. Some other options, my least favorite one is to just wait five or 10 minutes. That's kind of like the, eh, maybe it'll fix itself. But uh, yeah, it's not good troubleshooting. <laughs> um, another option was to restart the WMI or WinRM services. You know, you can do those via some, uh, via the restart service commandlets. I think you might have to do it via invoke command. Um, I'm not positive. Most effective way, quickest way, um, other than taking it into apply only beforehand was to just kill WMI. So I have a one liner right here, invoke command, where we would just you know, execute a git process WMI star and stop process on any machines that weren't accepting their configuration and then we would immediately apply a new configuration and it would generally take it. Some other challenges, um, big one was when we're pushing out a new configuration to 120 servers that have 70 some odd resources being configured, it's parsing the output for failures. Um, and within the PowerShell ISC, unfortunately there, maybe in PowerShell 5 there is, but PowerShell 4, which is the only one that's supported with Exchange 2013, doesn't have a find within the window. So um, what we ended up doing is we, after we had run the script and we had this massive blob of output, copy the whole thing to notepad, and then search for PS computer name. So for all DSC errors that you'll encounter, they all state the error, um, some, uh, some exception specific information, and then say PS computer name, and then whatever computer it failed on. So we just search for those within the output, and then those we knew were machines we would have to go remediate. Already talked about Active Directory replication issues. Last thing, um, IS resets. Um, caused new PowerShell sessions to, or remote PowerShell sessions to time out. So certain configuration changes would um, cause the DSC resource to do an IS reset, and that would kill our remote PowerShell session. And then the next resource would run, it would try to reestablish the remote PowerShell session, but at the same time, like 15 or 20 exchange app pools were trying to spin up in the machines, you know, 100% CPU, and a remote PowerShell session would time out. And we'd have to give it some time for the server to die down and then rerun the configuration. So, what went well? We were able to quickly deploy 120 servers. So, the first couple DAGs, we hit, you know, Hit some DSE issues, also hit a number of non-DSE issues where we had to go in and investigate, figure out what was going on, do some configuration changes, and reevaluate what we were doing. After the first couple DAGs, though, I would say we deployed the remaining uh, almost 100 servers in probably a little over a month. I don't have the specific dates, but I'm guessing it's a month. And um, that's, uh, you know, that's about as fast as my customer was comfortable going. They like to checkpoint stuff along the way and make sure you know, stuff's good before they're moving on able to easily use the same configuration in four different environments. Like I said, using those separate environment, environment or configuration data files, I was easy, easily able to test everything I did in my own lab first, then go to the two customers' test labs, and then finally in production. By that time, you know, fairly confident that the DSC scripts are gonna run uh, properly. The scripts execute much faster than standard Exchange PowerShell scripts, um, or commandlets. A lot of uh, exchange commandlets run decently quick regardless of where you're running them. Um, but any ones that communicate with an IS metabase, for instance, if you try to do those over a LAN and it's just a standard RPC connection over the LAN, they can take forever to come back. With DSC, um, all the servers are essentially doing a remote power, so a local, uh, from a local WMI process are doing a remote power cell session to themselves. So um, it's very quick and it kind of um, allows us to blast out a configuration to all 120 servers in parallel and just let them do their thing. Configuration scripts function as documentation. I don't know about you guys, but reading configuration and parameters out of DSC scripts is a lot easier for me than in standard PowerShell scripts. And then finally, which was the whole goal of the project, is no more configuration drift. So 
until we find uh, something that we haven't thought of yet. But then we'll create a DSE resource for it. So. Have you had to push changes to your uh, initial configuration? Yet? So like, so you've got you know all your stuff covered. <laughs> have, have you changed any like base parameters and then push that change out across the environment? Yeah, uh, and that's that's what I was talking about. Where we've recently decided we want to do it and apply only instead. We've uh, they're they're not fully in production yet. They um, they're piloting one of the DAGs, but they have deployed all their servers. And we've done probably like five change management windows where we had to go in and do some some tweaks. So, yep. Awesome. All right. And then lastly, uh, last slide. Moving forward. So. Uh, what do I have left to do with the X Exchange module? So the first thing, we have Exchange 2016 releasing, um, I don't have a specific date, but the Exchange team has publicly said that it should be last quarter of this year. So could be any day now, could be, could be December 31st, I don't know. Um, but we're gonna need to test out all the X, the X Exchange module um, against Exchange 2016. And if anything doesn't work, we're gonna have to upgrade the resources. So, so it works for that. I'm hoping, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're not going to have to do much because the, the commandlet set hasn't really changed too much between Exchange 2013 and 2016, but we'll see. Before I can do that, though, I need to rewrite all the tests in Pester. Um, Pester, either I didn't know of it or did not exist um, when I wrote this, so I did my own custom tests cases, but now Pester is uh, what we recommend, so I want to have a proper test framework before I try to do this. And last, um, since we've gone open source, we started getting a number of community contributions and uh, community suggested issues. So I'm uh, hoping to go through and start uh, picking off some of these issues because uh, the community is coming up with some, some really, good, uh, really good suggestions and finding some issues that you know, I, I definitely didn't think of. So, and that is it.